The whole idea behind democratic government is that the people have a say in how they are governed. Sounds obvious, simple, and essential. But David Mosscroft's new book might make you think twice about that. It's called Too Dumb for Democracy, Why We Make Bad Political Decisions and How We Can Make Better Ones. Author and postdoctoral fellow at the University of Ottawa, David Mosscroft joins us now. It's really nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you. I saw this book a few months ago and I was like, I must have him on the show. So it's nice to have you here. I'm so glad that you invited me on. So I'll ask you an open, like a wide question. Why do we make dumb political decisions? Well, it's, it's tempting to say that we're, we're just too stupid. I mean, this is, you hear this all the time. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, people always exempt themselves. They think about someone else when they say that. But the, the truth of the matter is we have phenomenal capacity when we have the training and the opportunity and the time to make good political decisions. Mm -hmm. But we never do. So we make bad political decisions in part because we've evolved in such a way that there are psychological limitations to, to what we're able to do in a given moment, but also because the world in which we live, our environment, isn't conducive to making good political decisions. So if a good political decision takes time and reflection and, and sort of rationally engaging with the world and, and resources, mm -hmm. um, and the environment calls for that, well, look at what we've got. Quite the opposite, in fact. Well, throughout the book, you do go into some of the reasons why we do we make the, the, the decisions that we make. Um, but you also talk about yourself a little bit. Mm -hmm. And you say that when you were younger, you were a member of the Liberal Party, and you describe yourself as a keener. Yes, very <laughs> I, keen. I think When I hear keener, I think of Milhouse from The Simpsons. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but since that time, uh, you say that you've become less enamored with uh, party uh, affiliation. Why is that? Well, I was young and keen, and, and I deeply fascinated with Pierre Trudeau as a figure. And, and I mean, I was born in '84, so I was born around the time he was retiring. But uh, it, you know, I was interested, and in, and for whatever reason, I got drafted into the Liberals because they were there and, and appealing enough. I didn't last very long, a couple of years, and I left, and, and don't miss it. Why did you leave? Well, I left because. Uh, it started to dawn on me that the nature of partisan politics had become too much like a sport. Now, you can be partisan in a productive way and partisan in a less productive way. If you're partisan because you have a coherent ideology and you think it's right and you want to band together with other people to try to have a coherent, coordinated strategy and offer people an alternative that they can look at and say, okay, I see where those folks are, then that's fine. But if it becomes about uh, strategy, tactics above all else, it's just about winning for the sake of winning, and manipulating people to do it, to get there, well then it's less appealing. And so partisanship in the sort of contemporary political environment has become less about advancing coherent political philosophies or ideologies, and more about trying to mobilize tactics and strategies to win at any cost. Well, well when we are making these uh, political decisions that not only affect us individually, but uh, collectively as a society, mm -hmm. uh, what should we consider more, the party or the person leading the party? Well, I mean, neither, ideally. I mean, the problem is, is we tend to think, okay, I'm going to vote because I like the party, I'm going to vote because I like the leader. Now, we think that we're doing, so, we often think we're doing something rational. We, you know, we're, you either expect that voters are going to go and read the manifestos, which they don't do, or you expect that they have a coherent connection that's based on ideology and policy, which they sometimes do but often don't. So in the American context, there was a study years ago by, by Professor Mark Evans and, and his colleague and they found that a voter's assessment of the economy was dependent on which party they preferred, right? Uh, so they didn't say, how's the economy doing? Okay, now I'm gonna judge the president. They said, do I like the president? Okay, now I'm gonna judge the economy. Now, that happens in Canada too. Uh, partisan affiliation becomes a lens, becomes part of your identity, and it warps the world. Mm -hmm. That's an issue if we expect people to make good political decisions based on things like policy and, and evidence. Mm. Well, in uh, Too Dumb for Democracy, you point out that humans are cognitive misers uh, who use mental shortcuts. Uh, could you explain that for us? Uh, we've evolved to try to do the most uh, cognitively with, with the, the least amount of resources, which makes sense. You know, there's a lot going, around, going on around you. The world's complicated. The world's busy. You don't have time to sit down and judge and think through everything. I mean, we wouldn't have survived as a species is if every time you had to make a decision, you sat down and reflected. We, we would have never made it out of, out of a forest. We would have never made it out of a cave. We would have never made it across 
uh, throughout a jungle or across a savanna, right? We would have been eaten alive. So that's the old evolutionary explanation is that, well, you've got to be able to make quick decisions, and we're really good at that. So we are cognitive misers in the sense that we use a limited amount of, of resources to reach a decision. Now, that's good for some things, like dodging a car that's coming at you out of nowhere, or deciding if you want to turn left or right, or if you want spaghetti or, or salad. It's less good when you're trying to make a complicated political decision. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the times we kind of go on autopilot. Cognitive autopilot. Mm -hmm. and, and part of the corrective, part of making better political decisions, is kicking yourself off of cognitive autopilot. Mm -hmm. Which is hard to do. Which is very hard to do. Well, in uh, Too Dumb for Democracy, you're right. One of the marvelous things about human beings is our ability to look at the world as it is and imagine it otherwise. Seeing a stone and imagining it as a stone axe for shaping the world around you is different from seeing a group of people and imagining a system in which they have inalienable rights and in which they and you are expected to take part in deciding how to live together. Liberal democracy requires and expects certain things from its citizens, such as the ability to make autonomous and rational decisions that we tend to underdeliver on or fail to deliver at all. Uh, why do we tend to underdeliver? Well, I mean, in part, it's overpromising or overexpecting as well. So we, the whole book project came out of my dissertation at the University of British Columbia. And uh, when I was reading about democracy and democratic deliberation and political philosophy, I, I came across a, puzzle, a bit of a puzzle. We have these high standards for ourselves of who we expect ourselves to be rational, autonomous, careful thinkers, critical thinkers. And we hold this up as the ideal. Mm -hmm. But there were just decades and decades and decades of literature from psychology, sociology, anthropology that said, that's not who we are. That's who might, that might be who we think we are or who we want to be, but that's not who we are. So how do we get there, mm -hmm. right? So we under deliver because we're not you know, necessarily built for that any more than we're built for hitting a fastball out of the womb. I'm guessing a lot of people don't want to hear that, though. Well, it's funny. Is when I years ago I did an episode of CBC Ideas, and it was called "Too Dumb for Democracy." Full stop. And it aired, and it airs to quite a few people. And I woke up the next day thinking, "I'm in trouble." Right. I'm going to hear from people now, and I started to hear from people, and everyone said, "Love the title. Absolutely agree." And then they would say, "I know exactly who you're talking about." Not myself. No. It's my neighbor, my <laughs> dentist, my doctor. My spouse. <laughs> right. right. Uh, so people, they're, they're open to hearing this. Now, the problem is getting them to realize that it's them I'm talking about mm. uh, and, that, and, and that it's a problem that, that ought to be addressed. And I include myself. I don't exempt myself from any of the critiques of the book. In fact, I spent a lot of time in the book talking about how I'm part of the problem. And, and so uh, the, the tricky thing is convincing people that it's a problem that's worth solving. And how do you do that? Well, I start by saying we could lose everything. Uh, we think that democracy and, and civilization as, as, as it has evolved and developed is an achievement that once unlocked is, is forever ours, as if we couldn't possibly lose it. But the history of democracy and the history of civilization is a history of, of collapse as much as, a, as it is a history of anything else. So I, I try to make the case in the book that we could lose everything, especially when you face down challenges like climate change. Are we really prepared to deal with climate change? Are we really prepared to deal with the changing world order? I'm not sure that we are, but we can prepare ourselves to be if we take good political decision making more seriously. Uh, in the green room, we were talking about, um, we live in such a unique time because uh, we have a different component to deal with, which is the information that we're getting online. And you write that political advertising that manip uh, manipulates our emotions um, is standard pa uh, practice. And the internet is home to new and frightening ways of leading voters astray. Um, do you see a way to combat this trend in order to protect us from making even worse political decisions? I, I mean, I do. I mean, there is, I think, at least an approach towards the solution, and it's necessary. I, I think we underestimate the degree to which our information space has been polluted and will become even more polluted. So think about deep fakes, this idea that you can use uh, technology, AI, um, to effectively doctor a video so convincingly that you would not be able to tell the difference between the actual politician speaking and the doctored video, or whomever it may be, celebrity or whomever it may be. So that, that's going to be par for the course soon enough. 
question is, okay, well, what do you do? You've got fake news, you've got misinformation, you've got disinformation, you've got bots, you've got mm -hmm. deep fakes. How do you address that? Well, part of it is, is creating a media space where there are good, reliable sources of information that, that people trust and can go to, because they know that it's not going to come from TVO, it's not going to come from you, it's not going to come from me. Part of it is also getting social media companies who are purveyors of this. They're, uh, they don't like to be called publishers or broadcasters, but they serve that function. Part of the problem is getting them to take this seriously, to say, we're going to make sure that we know where the line is and, and we police it so the information uh, environment doesn't become too polluted. But then a huge part of it is also um, individuals developing capacities and skills so that they can detect and manage the stuff, right? So you sort of deal with it on the supply side, but you also deal with it on the demand side. So we're talking about the internet, but before the internet, um, we would get uh, commercials on television. Um, can you tell us about the face ad that was used in the 1993 Canadian federal election and what it tells us about emotion-targeted political advertising? Yeah, so it, this was a well, you know, an infamous ad run by the Tories against Jean Chrétien in the '93 federal election, and it, it showed him a photo of him, an unflattering photo of him that sort of emphasized uh, nerve damage in his face as a result of, of an illness of, of Bell's palsy, now, of a disease. Now, uh, there was some sort of ominous overlay. You know, is this a leader, right? Which is political ads are infamous for. What they were trying to do is take some utterly irrelevant consideration, which was his appearance, and tie it to something that was relevant, his competency. Uh, it was dirty pool, it was a low blow, it was a, but it was trying to create an, an emotional association to get you to judge him as distrustful or incompetent. But it backfired on the Tories. Uh, it was widely seen as inappropriate, and they pulled it immediately. But you, in the book, you say that um, some people think that if they hadn't pulled it, it might actually have worked. Yeah, so it would have been a battle between people's disgust, because people were disgusted, rightfully so, by the ad, but also by their sort of emotional connection to the message. So it would have been a real challenge to those competing emotional attachments. But that takes time. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it reveals a couple of things, is that we have emotions that come are combative within us, uh, that it takes time to establish sometimes those, those narratives, but also that emotional appeals can, can backfire on you if you're not too, too careful. Parties are getting pretty good mm -hmm. at them so far, but, but they certainly can backfire. Uh, well, you, uh, you go deeper in the book about um, what happened in the American election in 2016 with Hillary mm -hmm. Clinton and Donald Trump and Hillary's emails, um, but there's also recently uh, in the news We've seen a video of uh, Speaker uh, Nancy Pelosi um, and uh, appearing to be drunk. Uh, what connection do you see between the face ad and that recent video with Nancy Pelosi? Well, I mean, the, the, the face ad was uh, attempting to do the same thing as the Pelosi video, which was to sort of to manipulate people into judging someone as unfit to lead because of something utterly irrelevant to the question at hand. But the Pelosi video is is more frightening because it was effectively a doctored and edited video. Uh, the technology has, you know, since 1993, between 1993 and 2019, the technology is much better. We can produce far more compelling manipulative videos and video clips in 2019 than in 1993. So it's the same problem, effectively, but uh, the technology is more effective. And, but also the distribution network is more effective. You can go and see the Pelosi thing still, whether or not anybody wants you to see it. The Tories pulled the ad in 93, and that was it. There was nowhere to go watch it. Mm -hmm. Today, you could watch those videos over and over and over again. In fact, you might not even know that they were pulled. Mm -hmm. um, I think, because we do talk about it a lot in the news, um, I think some people might be OK with that. They might know that that video is doctored. Uh, so what if we are fine with the results of our behavior, even if we know that we're being manipulated in the process? We often are. We often are. And the, you know, there's an old line attributed to Mark, uh, to Mark Twain that uh, a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth has a chance to put its pants on. Mm. So that's problem one, is that the lie is persistent and, and rapid. But problem two is the one you identify. Well, what if people figure it out that it's a lie but just don't care? And that's often the case, because we aren't necessarily driven or incentivized or motivated to get the right answer or the truthful answer. We're often motivated or incentivized to get an answer we can live with or that we like, or that pre or, or reconfirms, or confirms rather, our pre-existing biases. 
Now that's the problem, the fundamental problem of politics is that often we won't care about things we ought to be caring about because we're trying to satisfy a different urge or a different need. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I'm arguing for the book is, is a return to, or I should just say a turn to, I'm not convinced we were ever there, uh, to a deeper and rational reflective politics that says, look, there's space for emotion, but you should be aware of what the, that emotion is. You should put it on the table. You should engage with it rather than just settling for you know, the sort of confirmation of your prejudices. Uh, to go back in the book, um, you discuss a study that polled Americans on whether or not they supported government assistance programs for African Americans. And you point out that um, political scientist Paul Snyderman and his colleagues found that the explanations that people were giving for their support or opposition to social assistance to African Americans was based on rationalization rather than reasoning. Uh, what the study subjects were doing was reasoning backwards. Those whose opinions were driven by affect would immediately reach a conclusion without really thinking about it and then double back to fill in the middle bits based on how we expect people to think about political issues by providing evidence, thinking critically, and so forth. Um, a few things to ask about that passage. First off, uh, what is meant by people who were driven by affect? So we, we often think of ourselves as, as primarily concerned with with rationality and reasoning, collecting information about the world, assessing the evidence, and sort of logically coming to a conclusion. Mm. A lot of the time, we're just driven by emotion. I like this, I dislike this, I'm disgusted by this, I'm attracted to this, whatever it might be. And so that's the effect of connection, sort of approach or avoid based on mm. all kinds of different considerations, often prejudicial, either toward or, or against, whatever it may be. So rather than sort of rationally considering something, reasoning through, we will let our guts do the thinking for us. And that's thinking backwards, reasoning backwards? Well, then comes the reasoning backwards. So say I reach a conclusion that, I don't know, uh, I like pro uh, product X. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. But then someone says, well, why? Well, I might feel pressure to explain why. And I say, well, you know, I, I, the nutritional value, and uh, I like the nutritional value, and uh, I really believe in the company. We're going to want to provide an answer that's rational and coherent. But the truth is, sometimes you just like things or don't like things. And it has nothing to do with reasons that you can access. Now, when you do that in politics, you get people saying, I'm a liberal, I'm a conservative, I'm a new Democrat, I'm a green. And you say, well, why? They don't always know. They often don't know. But they feel like they need to give you an answer. So they'll work backwards from their conclusion to try to rationalize it with all kinds of reasons. The problem is often those reasons are completely fabricated or incoherent. And how does that affect our political decisions? Well, it means we might not be getting what, we're, what we think we're getting. We might be uh, expecting one thing or, or, or trying to pursue one thing but get another. It means that we're very easy to manipulate. Mm -hmm. And it means we're very slow to change our minds in many cases. And it also means that it makes it tough to sit down and have a conversation with someone because someone wants to change your mind or they want to be themselves convinced or they want to understand. And you're sitting there effectively lying to yourself and that other person back and forth. It's really hard, though, to look at yourself and say how I'm thinking is wrong or I should maybe take a different approach. It's really hard to do that, isn't it? It is. But when people do learn about these things, they, they do start to change or they do have opportunities to change. So, you know, at the th final third of the book, I talk about a little program for self-assessing and doing better. And just knowing that these cognitive biases exist, just knowing that we're cognitive misers or that we're rationalizers mm -hmm. or we're motivated reasoners or whatever, knowing that those potholes are on the road makes it actually much easier for us to avoid. Uh, so part one is, is realizing that there's a problem. Mm -hmm. Well, you point out that many people are more flexible and reasonable on political issues than we tend to assume. Mm -hmm. um, how do we tap into this flexibility in order to achieve good political decision making? So, I mean, there, there's things that we have to do and things that I think governments should do. The, there's a whole bunch of things we should do. So off the top of my head, you know, surrounding yourself with people who disagree with you in good faith, who aren't disagreeable, but who disagree, is, is a great way to start. Uh, taking a little bit of time every day to actually think about this stuff, 20 minutes, you know, the length of a sitcom or, or a show that you might be binging on, on a streaming service. Mm -hmm. um, finding you know, sources that you trust, but, but having a variety of them, so you're not just going back to the same well every day. Um, and knowing that there are problems, like the sort of problem that I discuss in the book, just knowing that these are challenges. All of that is a great way to start addressing some of those problems. On the government side, we need opportunities to practice this in real life. Things like citizens' assemblies, participatory budgeting, uh, substantive meetings between politicians and, and 
individuals, citizens, mm -hmm. not just sort of town halls where everyone's rallying around the party flag. And you even suggest making it, like, making us have to vote, like you have to vote by law. Oh, I strongly support mandatory voting, but, but less because of citizens and more because it forces political parties to try to appeal to everyone. Because mm. right now political parties can micro-target. Mm -hmm. They can try to mobilize this group, but demobilize the, that group. With mandatory voting, you know, those incentives change. Uh, you do talk about institutions, uh, government, being, government being an institution. Another one that you talk about is the one that we're in, uh, the media. And I think the media, um, you know, finds itself in uh, a unique position that it's probably been in the past. Uh, but how can we, the media, do a better job of helping people make better political decisions without ha us getting our backs up against the wall? Yeah, I mean, I, I consider myself part of the problem here and part of the solution as well. I mean, I'm a, I'm a columnist. I write uh, long form pieces. Uh, I do TV, radio and shows like this. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm in that ecosystem and I understand the, the sort of the incentives and the pressures are to be quick, uh, to be appealing, to get the, the sort of clickbaity headline, to be provocative, uh, to to push back against critique in a stylish way, you know, the, that gets rewarded with attention. Mm -hmm. And to be fast, none of those are particularly good for making good political decisions. Um, you know, the goal should be how do I take the time to help people understand something? How do I provide the resources for someone to understand what's going on around them? How do I provide the toolkit for them to understand what's going around them? That often means slowing down. Mm -hmm. It means writing very accurate headlines. It means deeply researching pieces. Uh, talking to a variety of sources and not just pulling the quote that might, you know, be the sexiest quote or the most uh, show-worthy a quote, but perhaps the, the most accurate and best representation of what someone believes. But that's hard to do. I mean, it's, it's easy to say the media should do that. But in any era, it's tricky. And in this era of a changing media landscape and diminishing resources, it's very, very, di very difficult indeed. So then it falls back on citizens mm -hmm. to support the media so that they can do the work they need to do and governments to, to support the media so that they can do the work that they can do. Because again, if not, it, it risks contributing to broader problems like the ones we were talking earlier. Um, uh, I'm just listening back on our conversation and I wonder, um, is democracy in part to blame for us making bad political decisions? Probably a little bit. I mean, I open the book with, it's such a cliche, but I open the book with that Churchill quote that democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others that have been tried from time to time. Mm -hmm. It's a cliche, but it's, but it's true. It's that, you know, ultimately, democracy is, is a good political system because it more or less helps people get what they want, provides accountability. Um, but it also means that politicians and citizens get to get away with a lot. And, and the way that we practice democracy might not be the best way to practice it, right? I mean, we're so removed from it. We elect someone every four years, five years, and then we don't really think about it day to day. We're, it's not a participatory democracy. And the economy, and then of course, it's not supported by, by democratized institutions outside of politics. So for instance, the economy. So it makes it very hard for everyone to participate if they don't have the resources or the skill sets or the time to do so. So the sort of variety of liberal democracy that we practice is a real hands-off version. My contention in the book is, is that that does contribute to bad political decision making, but it's also insufficient to, to address the challenges that are coming, that we need to double down on democracy and have a more inclusive and participatory version of it. And you say that um, the cure for the ills of democracy is more democracy. Uh, what do you mean by that? So there's a moment right now, we've been here before, but we're, we're definitely back, of sort of authoritarian populism, sort of Bolsonaro, Trump, Brexit, Boris Johnson, uh, and then on the other hand, a rise of technocracy, of sort of let the experts decide. We'll just live our lives. Mm -hmm. um, both of those say, let's pull away from democracy, right? Let's not trust citizens too much. Even the populists don't really trust citizens. They're going to tell them what they think more than reflect it. And the technocrats, they don't care at all. They just want the experts to govern. Now, we might say, given the problems that we're facing, we'll go this way or that way, but we don't want to involve ordinary day-to-day -day citizens too, too much more in the political process because we can't trust them. And hey, look, Dave's just outlined all these things in his book, all these reasons why we shouldn't, mm -hmm. which is exactly the wrong conclusion. We're at a moment where democracy is under threat and we could lose it. That's the moment we should bring ordinary citizens 
into the process more than they have ever been in this process before, to give them the space, the time, the resources to take part, to, to build civic skills, to learn how to navigate the media space, to communicate to politicians what they want, why they want it, and to trust in the system so that when the worst arrives of, say, climate change or whatever it may be, we're prepared to resist that because it's our system. It's not something that's done to us. It's something we do. Well, as you know, there's a federal election <laughs> in just a few short months. Um, in your view, do you think we're better off with minority governments or majorities? Well, I'm deeply biased, and, and I recognize the bias. I have a fondness for minority governments, but I'll try to reason, not rationalize. I'll try to reason my way through it. <laughs> um, minority governments force political parties to cooperate day to day in the legislature with, with at least one other party, sometimes two or even three. Um, it makes them vulnerable. So every day they have to go out and they have to earn it. They can't dog it. They, every day they've got to leave it all in the field. Um, so. You know, it, it forces, now anyone who's lived through a minority government will tell you it's awful, <laughs> they're exhausted all the time, it's very difficult, but good, it should be. Um, because the other thing it does is, it forces parties to consider things they would otherwise never consider. Mm -hmm. And they end up being remarkably productive and creative moments, and, and I'll give you the greatest example. Uh, Lester B. Pearson's government between 1963 and 1968, uh, when we got CPP, uh, Medicare, mm -hmm. the flag, the auto pact, all kinds of nice things. Uh, we could be headed towards that. We could be headed towards a remarkably creative time in Canadian politics and productive time, and, and I think we could use it. David, thank you so much. This is such a fantastic book, and I hope that you'll come back onto the show because we've got so much more to talk to you about. Oh, my pleasure, anytime. And uh, good luck on the second book. Thank you. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.